All right, everybody out there, it's uh, great to have you all back. For those of you who have been coming and anybody who's new, it's great to have you. Uh, we are, uh, once again, doing the Cam and Chris show, the webinars for U.S. Rowing. And on behalf of U.S. Rowing, thanks for joining us. Tonight's guest is Chris Kerber, men's lightweight coach at Cornell University. Uh, Chris, thanks for being here. Um, Sir, thanks for having me. Sorry, um, Chris, you want to go on to the next slide? So uh, as we get started tonight, just a reminder, we have two tomorrow back to back. Um, the first one will be on how to set up a strength training circuit at your house when you don't have a gym available to you. So what do you have uh, kicking around the house to help? And then the second one will be at four. Uh, actually, that's, uh, that's typed wrong. So tomorrow we will be three to four and then 4.30 to 5.30. So I'm glad we just looked at that. Uh, so if you're out there, tomorrow we start 3 to 4 will be the first one, and then half an hour break, and then 4.30 to 5.30. And that, the second one will focus on uh, the different lifts, especially around the hip hinge, and how to, what is the correct form, and make sure that we're not training any injuries into our, into our bodies. Um, Monday, we're going to have Jim Dietz, and he's going to be talking to the Masters crowd and, and how to rig for the Masters rower. And then on Tuesday, we will have Coach Steve Gladstone, uh, how he selects his team and how he selects his lineups. So that'll be pretty interesting as well. Um, what do we got for the next one, Chris? Uh, this is this will show you where everybody's at tonight. What Two nights in a row, Cam. We got Pennsylvania leading the way. Look at this. Um, pretty cool. California was killing it for the first couple of times, but Pennsylvania is showing up. Uh, and next, oh, there we go. Over, 37% everybody is high school rowers. Um, masters rowers, 25%. And then people who are a little bit of a mix. So, um, okay. Chris, uh, I'm going to let you get started so that we don't waste any of your time. And it's a pleasure to have you. So thanks for being here. Uh, great to be here. And uh, thank you both uh, Chris and Cam for selecting me to be a part of this. Um, thanks for the some almost 200 participants. Some people are still coming on. Um, thank, thanks uh, for sharing your Friday evening here with uh, just kind of a, just a little bit of a chat on rowing, chat on um, what, what got me here um, tonight was uh, just a story I was telling Cam just about how I um, navigated the, um, uh, the just discovery and, and, and talking to the guys uh, about the season that ended uh, two weeks ago, uh, Wednesday. So um, just walk, walking, walking people through that. Anyway, um, thank you very much again for, for coming out tonight. So uh, hey, hey Chris, let me yeah. just remind everybody that if you have questions, uh, the Q&A uh, tab, you can press that, put your question in, and when the time is right, uh, I'll ask them of Coach Kerber, and um, periodically he'll say, you know, he'll ask me for any questions. So if you have a question, please put it in there in the questions and the Q&A part. So tonight's presentation um, is leading through adversity and ordinary, uh, extraordinary times, um, especially when leading is not that easy, when it's convoluted or there's challenge, um, there's loss. Anyway, I look at it like uh, practicing to start um, when you're when you're leading through these these situations. You're not going to be good at it right away, um, but you got to keep practicing it. Um, you got to kind of marry up with um, challenges like that and uh, meet them head on. Um, guaranteed, your your people that you work with, uh, your athletes, your staff, your support staff will will benefit um, through just being human and uh, walking people through this. Um, a little bit about me. Um, I'm in my 12th season here at Cornell. Um, I just won, uh, the team just won um, its fourth national championship uh, in six seasons, in the previous six seasons. Um, it's, been a, it's been a great run, but uh, a lot of it has to do with understanding and teaching leadership and, and presenting vocabulary around that. Uh, building a great culture through our assistant coaches, through our athletes, through our, our senior leadership. 
Um, so that's um, pretty exciting. Before that, I, I wrote on the US team from 1993 to, to 2000. One of the stories I have um, that connects two weeks ago, Wednesday, to uh, was one of the losses I had during on the, on the national team. So I'll share that with you. Um, the goal tonight is to um, discuss and iron out some tactics taken and, um, and, and discuss kind of the way people walked their teams, their staff, um, you know, maybe their colleagues at work or their colleagues, um, how they did it, how they managed. Um, in 12 years of, of coaching, um, I definitely in the last, say, six years, my, my ears have been turned up to the way people lead, any organization, any group of people, and the messaging behind it, um, the way that they kind of discover their authenticity, and um, the way that they execute it in, in their own way. So um, I think part of this tonight is even organizing my own thoughts, and, uh, and then just fostering really dis, uh, constructive discussion um, as we definitely navigate these challenging times. Um, as coaches, we, we definitely have an advantage. We have, we have a lot of credibility and, and a PhD in creating relationships. Um, and part of what I'm gonna talk about is these relationships I have with these athletes and, and the relationships you have with your athletes and your staff. Um, we, we're trying to get the best out of everyone every day. And uh, that requires some real engagement, some real um, discussion and creating relationships and these really, really tight bonds. If, if somebody asked me, hey, Curbs, um, how come you're winning so much? I would say is we create a real big trusting environment where we are. And, um, and we allow people to kind of rise and lead as, as they are. So, um, and, and at the root of that is allowing people to have great relationships, bring what they can, um, keep people accountable, and um, uh, allow people to contribute at, at, their, at their own level um, in every, every way, shape, and form. Um, and that, all that does is create really, really trusting relationships, and, and you can see it in some of the, the racing that we do and, and what, what it takes in trust. So uh, I'm gonna get right into Right into last uh, two weeks ago, Wednesday, um, <clears throat> and my modified uh, PowerPoint, leading through extraordinary times, especially when it isn't easy. Eight wasn't wasn't there before, but uh, anyway, when when I um, started dispersing this subject and connecting with people, and uh, thanks for those who who definitely contributed. Um, Somebody said to me, so, nothing prepares you for times or events like these. A season canceled came very, very quickly um, for all of us. Um, nothing can prepare you for that impact. So I was asked to provide some insight tonight from Cam and Chris and, and just have, have a chat um, about when I met with the seniors and uh, with, uh, with the squad that was canceled. We were, uh, we were defending national champions 2019. We had some good talent in the pipeline. Um, we had a good head of steam of culture. Um, again, with this, you know, four, four really great seasons out of our previous six um, and, and a great pipeline um, and, and a great culture where, where everybody was truly on the same page with what we were doing. So anyway, I'm gonna go back to my original um, theme here is nothing prepares you for these times like these. Well, I'm gonna to connect to a personal story. When I walked in the boathouse that day and I said to the captains, I'd like to meet with the senior class 15 minutes before we were supposed to row. And we were gonna row you know, at five that day, which is the normal meeting point at the boathouse. Anyway, I grabbed my sixth grader and I grabbed this puppy and I said, we got to go <laughs> and uh, engage with these guys who are hurting right now. And I, I told my sixth grader, I said, hey, you're going you're gonna to see people sad 
And I, I said, I'm not here to teach you a lesson. I just want you to see what it's like to go to work with me on a day like this. Anyway, the personal story goes like this. 24 marches ago, I was racing off for the lightweight straight four, the very first year that the lightweights were in the 96 Olympics. I was on the team for the previous four years, in and out of the four, the eight. Um, I had won one gold medal in 1993. Um, in, in 1996, in March, we, we came off the water one night after seat racing in these straight fours. Trials were the beginning of April down in, um, down in Atlanta. Came off the water one night. It was in the, it was in the 30s. Had, a, had a, 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 a rower's cough, as you would say. You know, that cough that when you, you kind of extended yourself that much. I think we were doing 1500s, 34, 36. We're racing off for seats, four seats for the Olympics. I had an uh, exceptional winter, so always in the top group. Um, we were um, putting together the, the, the fours. Anyway, came off the water that night with a bit of a cough. Um, woke up the next morning with a, with a fever. And um, two days later, I was in the hospital getting a chest X-ray. And um, it was the night of the, uh, the Emmys, very late March, and I remember this because I was watching this in my hotel or in my hospital room. Um, and at 4 a.m., after being admitted at like eight at, eight at night, uh, a resident said, hey, look, this guy uh, collapsed his lung. Anyway, eight days later, two chest tubes later, I was released from the hospital three days to, uh, until we would leave for the trials. At that point, there was a massive number of people supporting uh, me getting back in the boat, uh, including doctors, Dr. Hosey, uh, one of the greats, guy was on my, on my bedside, my family, um, uh, the team came to the hospital, Princeton Medical Center. Um, and I was really in no shape to trial, uh, but um, everybody was putting their best foot forward and supporting uh, someone who was definitely in a, in a position of loss. I think Jack Kerouac always says either you're on the bus or you're off the bus. Well, you get taught, sometimes you get tossed off the bus. And what I would say is when I met with these seniors that day, Again, two weeks ago, Wednesday, um, they were tossed off the bus like nobody's business. And the entire team was as our season was canceled. So I met with them like sometimes we do. Everybody grab a, a, a boat sling. Let's just circle up. Brought this puppy down. And um, I started to just talk to them, just talk. And um, you could see they were pretty banged up, a lot riding on, on this, really good senior class. And, um, and I just started to cry because I could see the, I, I was choked up. I could see the anguish in the room. I could see the pain. And uh, I just said, hey guys, like this sucks. Shook all their hands, hugged the cocks and um, started passing the puppy around. Great, great healing. That that little dog, that beautiful little puppy, um, took took a lot of our, a lot of the distraction, um, and I just started with, hey, this was, I would say, my best year of coaching, and we have no idea what the, what, what the outcomes were going to be, um, and I said it was because of this partnership between Coach Brumstead and myself, Bill Brumstead, who's. Um, in his seventh season as, as an assistant coach, one of the greatest followers, one of the greatest partners uh, we've had. Um, and just, again, a, just a trusting, trusting relationship. Not always easy, but at the end of the day, respect and trust. And we are, we are there for one reason. Anyway, I honored him. I honored the seniors. And I said, hey, look, I don't know where you guys are right now. But I'll, I'll tell you, I know about loss in this, in, this, uh, in this sport. And I started talking about the 96 Olympics and uh, my season and uh, getting knocked out of the four. 
due to this uh, pneumothorax, this collapsed lung. And, uh, and, it, and everybody just kind of took, took time to, to cry. And, um, and, and I said, the funny thing is at 4.30, I was on the phone and I had already known that, uh, that the season was over. And this was the theme is every day we put in everything we can. And at 4.30, Chris Korzanowski calls and I had put in a text to him and I said, hey, I, I hear you're down with Steve Gladstone. Let's talk about his finish. <laughs> and uh, I took a full page of notes uh, from Chris's and, and my just short conversation. Um, that day was our third day on the water, or was to be our third day on the water. Coach Brumstead and I were going to be in the launch together, do some uh, parallel coaching like what we do. Um, the three and four V, we're also going to be out. We're going to be in uh, a full group. Uh, the assistant coaches were there. We were all going to meet at the whiteboard. There was a lot of anticipation, a lot of work. But anyway, this great conversation with Chris, and I said, hey, it, it's all over. And uh, he said, I just was talking to, to Steve about it, and he'll have something to say about it on Tuesday. But um, I think that um, that sudden loss uh, in 96 kind of definitely softened the edge. The other thing I said to them uh, when we met as a full team, because I, I allowed the seniors to kind of, who were in the, in the deepest of, of the darkest cave, I allowed them to have their own time together and, and share and, um, and just voice how they were. And they were breaking down at different moments. And it was, it was a special time. Um, went out and met with the, uh, with the freshmen, sophomores, and juniors. Talked about this. Had the puppy out there. The dog took a pee in the boat bay, which was comical. There was a lot of these kind of like sad but comical times. And again, it was always around storytelling. In 96, I got out of the hospital and, and I was not selected. I went to the house where I was staying and I kicked the wall. And I said, guys, you can be angry. You can so be angry. You're allowed to be, but don't do what I did. I kicked the wall of a living room of the house I was staying in. And I thought I broke my foot. It hurt so bad. And I became so embarrassed by my behavior. But so I was guiding the guys. The other thing I, I talked to them about was do what we normally do. Um, a month before this uh, uh, March 11th event, uh, Valentine's Day, I woke up and my eight year old Ridgeback <clears throat> started coughing up blood. And uh, took her to the vet, and we and they basically said it's it's all over for this dog. You got to put her down. Um, it was a massive sudden loss. Um, I cried like a baby that day because I lost a, a family pet that I was so connected with. Anyway, what I told my my athletes was, do what you did that day. You saw me show up at practice. I was wearing my Valentine's goofy sweater. They did two by 2K, it was great. But I got about five emails from the men. Sorry for your loss. I got two cards. Um, they were there for me. And something as maybe trivial as a, as a family pet, it was a loss. I was, I was completely broken up. Uh, and in that, in that extraction, or in that, sorry, in that uh, experience, uh, a neighbor down the street who was concerned about our kids and losing a puppy. She's a, she was a uh, school teacher. She said, time, talk, and tears. Time, give it time, definitely talk about it, and there will be tears. And this is what I said to the men. I said, I'm, I'm, I'm giving you some, some great advice when somebody was, was in, in, uh, in not, not a great uh, point in grieving. Anyway, it was a special time. It was their own time. They had the choice to row, but they didn't. They showed up in street clothes and, and they just said they couldn't. They, uh, they put so much into it and uh, the end was the end. They had a great practice the night before. Um, so anyway, that's, that's the story of me connecting um, with the guys. Um, and le like I said, 
the, one, of the, one of the people who I spoke to, nothing prepares you for times like these. Well, 96 definitely prepared me for it. The loss of the puppy or the, the eight-year-old Ridgeback that I had no idea I was this connected with, who was my coffee buddy every morning, um, that loss. I was also at, <laughs> um, a week before I, I, uh, we had, our, during our, fall, our, our winter break, I went to the 9-11 Museum in, in New York City. And boy, I was a, uh, I was a trader uh, for a hedge fund um, during those times and uh, being a part of that, walking back into that experience where we were on the trading floor and, and dealing with a lot of things. We were not in New York City, thank God. But again, if the, those three events were definitely preparing me for whatever reason um, to, to lead people through some pain. Anyway, um, I think at the root of this, I also um, got, a, got another great connection um, when I was going through the subject matter. Um, if, if you want to uh, understand a, a program here in the, in the country that's uh, been through a bit of discomfort lately, um, last fall, the uh, Chicago Rowing Fe uh, Federation uh, lost three rowers. Um, I was recruiting one of the athletes. I could see the, the, the pain and the anguish on this young man's face. Um, I definitely talked to the parents and, and wanted to see the, the way that they were doing it. Anyway, one of the parents sent me this article, which has just recently been republished by the Harvard Business Review. Um, and it's basically understanding what grief is. Um, and the Harvard Business Review does a very, very, very nice job of breaking it down. Um, the research, uh, the, the thought leaders in, 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 in grief and in loss. Anyway, it was a really nice handhold for me uh, uh, preparing, this, uh, preparing this material. And look who it is. It's the doggy. There she is. <laughs> okay, get out of here. Uh, um, and um, it basically just goes through the five stages of grief, which is denial, anger, bargaining. And believe me, when the, uh, the, the C-19 virus was coming, coming through and you could, hear, you could hear denial in the airways, um, as things started getting uh, closer and, and through the, uh, the eye of the needle, there was definitely anger and bargaining. Hey, we can, we can do this. And then showing up at the boathouse at five o'clock on Wednesday, March 11th, there was sadness. There was sadness. Now it's not sadness of losing a job, not being able to pay your mortgage, losing a loved one, but um, something that these young men that were just so pure in their, in their lives was just taken away. Um, I can align with that. Anyway, as you, as you go through this continuum of denial, anger, bargaining, sadness, you move into acceptance where you're, you're starting to get control over things. And um, you're basically trying to, to guide your way to finding meaning in, in this. And um, so, um, I want to thank the, uh, the parent from the Chicago Rowing Federation who, 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 who gave this to me, who has had a lot of conversation about this, just open, raw, you know, conversation about um, her and the program, the coaches who I know and respect, the athletes that are, um, being, uh, that are, are going through that, um, uh, how they had a plan, how they discussed um, a lot of different things and, and had uh, therapy dogs down, perfect, you know, the puppy here, um, how they had um, uh, sports therapists and, and just just getting people back into the boat, getting them to a race. Can, can you imagine? I, I can't imagine that with three losses anyway. Uh, and, then, and then getting to this place called uh, of meaning or legacy. Um, I put this... Um, Good Grief, Charlie Brown is a, is a classic book in my uh, bookcase as a kid, full of cartoons. You know, the, the classic, pull the, pull the football away from Charlie. Um, but I think um, with this process and with my own personality of getting people from, from sadness to acceptance to, to meaning, there, there has to be humor. Like the story of me kicking the wall 
and near and thinking I was going to have to break my foot and me telling them how I had to patch the wall within 24 hours because the family was coming back and I made it look perfect. Um, there was even paint downstairs. I was so lucky, but um, I, I, I had to kind of laugh. We had to laugh about it. We had to laugh about those moments. I think what I did was, um, so that's, that's the first story. Um, uh, when we found our way to meaning, and again, thank you for that Chicago rowing parent who gave me this kind of direction, some guidance. I was definitely ripe for it. Um, what I have found in, in all the conversations, talked to some juniors about this, parents, uh, Cam and, and Chris, uh, some colleagues, um, some people outside the sport, some people outside of sport. Um, what I'm seeing just around the community is just people mobilizing, um, people just contributing um, to, to not only comforting the ill in the hospitals, but uh, you know, down into our rowing um, programs um, with information on websites, on uh, uh, supporting athletes through this. Um, basically, two days after um, the cancelization of the season, um, kids were sent home. Um, they start classes on Monday. Um, the same thing's happening in all the junior programs across the country. Um, and I'm sure there's plenty of Zoom and webinars going on, but um, to support these rowing programs around the country, um, parent groups, boosters, uh, I don't know how many alumni reached out to me um, who are just mobilizing. What can I do? Um, I heard about parents at junior programs um, putting together, uh, you know, uh, webinars with, with uh, yoga instructors um, teams having Zoom meetings around practices. Now we can't do that in, in, in the Ivy League. We can't hold a practice. Um, training programs being put out. Um, you can see you can see mobilization on, on, on social media, Twitter and Instagram. You can see how people are dealing with this, uh, with their Facebook daily stories and those challenges. People are mobilizing like like no other. It's it's amazing. And I think uh, somebody who gave the program last Thursday, uh, Coach Greg Hughes from Princeton says, there is no other time than right now to look at the way we do what we do. Um, because so much is stripped away and we are, we have to sit still and uh, engage through these, these, these ways. Um, and then to have introspection, um, have a, uh, uh, define some creativity um, uh, innovate, uh, look at things in a different way because we're going to have to start. And then as you look out into the horizon, wh where is this going to land? The mission for, for, for coaches uh, around the world, uh, at least uh, college or, or uh, university, uh, junior, the mission remains the same, that, that rowing becomes a um, – it, it aligns with the academic process, um, becoming a whole person through the discipline, through the, the highs and lows of, of racing, through training, through the discipline of it. Um, the mission remains the same, is to create an athlete, athlete experience that aligns with the student experience. And we have to stay on that, on that mission. But so, so by mobilizing, by uncovering meaning, um, where we're gonna land, I would say just something that we're, we're doing. I, I mobilized my two sets of captains. We nominated a second set of captains for next year. Uh, the two uh, highest ranking coxswains. I, um, funny story, I, I'm in charge of, uh, I, I do have access to the Instagram and I can post and I rarely do. But um, I mobilized them to, um, what, what's gonna give us meaning? How are we gonna honor these cup races? Tomorrow will be our Matthews Cup. It's the 68th running of the Matthews Cup. The, the only time that it wasn't run before that was World War II. Um, people ha have, um, there's so many names on that, on that trophy. It's so bent up and, and, and tarnished and, and beat up, but man, it is hardware like, like nobody's business. 
we've been racing off for that Matthews Cup since 1936, um, which is tremendous. Um, teams are just not racing now. So how do we find meaning and honor that not only with, um, not only with our athletes, um, with, with all the stakeholders, our, uh, our alumni, um, our families, our ever expanding families as parents, uh, brothers and sisters, um, people who come to cheer for us. Uh, and then, you know, our future Cornelians, our, our future uh, boathouse dwellers, um, the recruits, our prospects, how do we, how do we create meaning in, in that? So I, I offered it up to them through, through um, social media. Hey, what, how are we going to do this? All I want to do is honor it. All I want to do. So we have some ideas about, you know, senior spotlights. You're seeing that out there. Um, we have some ideas of, of uh, highlighting the number of uh, medical people on the front lines who came through the boathouse, who walked through those bay doors and now, you know, are being challenged like, like never before and in, in trying to uh, manage a, a pretty critical situation in our country. Um, also, just reaching across and, and, and talking to our, our, our competitors. I think um, the, the captains from one of the schools mobilized all the other captains on a group chat uh, on, on an email, just trying to mobilize people and, and reach across and, uh, again, just be there, be, being there for, for each other. So um, that's about the end of my chat here. I'm 30, 31 minutes into it. Um, I wondered if there was any questions. Again, this is, this is open dialogue. This is just people uh, wanting to share. I think there are some, some questions, can't, uh, Chris. And um, again, we're, we're, there, there's, really no, um, there's really no script for this. And, and definitely, things are going to be changing very quickly. Um, so I think having a strong, um, a, a, a strong set of values where you know you have to be supporting these people all the way through this. Um, so anyway, take it away with some questions. Uh, here, here's a question for you, Chris. Uh, how do we cope with tragedies like this that it's difficult for other people to relate to? Well, then I would say is um, I'm doing a, a, a book with my daughter this morning, first grader. She's reading a book on empathy online. And I was like, wow, this is great. Um, I think you have to be empathetic to knowing where people are um, who may not understand. Again, uh, I talked to some alums who run some factories here in New York State. And uh, as I'm managing the grief and, and, the, and the loss of, uh, of, of a season and working with young people. He's working, he, he's managing 550 people working in a factory that's non-essential. But these people are relying on their paychecks to pay their, pay their rent, pay their mortgages. Again, I, I think if we, if we understand just plain old loss, whether it be the loss of a loved one, um, a, a child, you know, an offspring, a young, innocent person. Um, maybe they don't have to get it right away. But what they do, maybe that relationship can, can grow through uh, just understanding what loss and grief is. Ella, uh, Ella wants to ask you, um, he mentioned something about guidance being the last step of grief. Who or what is a good thing to turn to for guidance? So one of the notes I have there on the frame, and uh, I, I skipped over it talking about 96 was, um, so when I came out of the hospital and I was not able to be selected for that four, that um, there was the right person, definitely Tim Hosey on, on Dr. Tim Hosey on, on the bedside, uh, 
Dr. Tony Churko, who's a neurosurgeon there in town who stopped by every day and just talked to me. And uh, he's a rower from Philadelphia. Also my cousin, Bob, who delivers babies in that, in that, uh, these were, pe these were the right people who had the right conversations at the right time. I was definitely uh, in a, in a bit of a, um, not a great situation, but the, that, that I would say the one, the two conversations I had, one with Michael Tatey, who said, Hey, look, I know you're going through grief here, but I need you as a spare. I need you. I need you. And that was the right conversation at the right time. The other one was when I watched the four <clears throat> qualify, I was sit I was standing next to Mike Vespoli, who had some just amazing things to say. Again, that right person with that right conversation at the right time. And that person has to be ready to receive that. Another question for you, Chris. What are your thoughts on how to come out of this uh, and bringing the teams back together after being apart for so long, not having a spring season to write off of? Cam and Chris um, reviewed this yesterday with me, um, kind of the tactic behind that. And um, I just, again, I use the word mobilize. The, the guys immediately mobilize for each other. Um, uh, the, the captains mobilize for each other. Um, our our uh, coaching um, peers uh, with the, the guidance and the leadership of Gary Caldwell, our commissioner, um, we're on, we're on calls. We're on, um, we were there for each other. Um, I, I think that's, that's pretty much the, um, put, putting it all back together. It, it's going to be staying connected, uh, over these, these calls today. I had conversations with sophomores, juniors, and seniors. Um, we have our kind of end of the season debrief. Um, hey, what, what, can, what did we do well and what can we do better? And it's a rankless debrief. They can say anything they want. We, we package, it, package it up. It's usually around communication um, for us, um, just teeing guys up and, and making them, uh, in a, putting them in a, in a great position of success. Again, it's usually around communication. So we'll continue creating that um, Hey, the show's going to go on. We're, we're planning to be back next fall. Um, my priority with them was their academics, making sure that they landed in a, in a place where they had the same um, uh, environment so that they could, they could study. And I definitely uh, encourage uh, the juniors out there on the call to make sure you got a great place to study and that you set up limits with mom and dad that you need to study and, and do this and, and make it right and uh, keep the GPAs up. I know our guys are pass fail, but it's important to, to um, give people tactics like that. Have those conversations with parents. Between these hours, I'm gonna be upstairs, can't be, this is important to me, my grades. So again, um, a lot of it is continuing coaching, continuing engagement, and then picking up the phone and, and talking to kind of the, the leaders of these networks on the team and it's not just freshmen, sophomore, junior, seniors. It might be engineers. It might be pre-med guys or a group of guys that, that kind of hang out um, and checking in with them and seeing how everybody is. Um, I think that's a really important thing. Uh, Sandy, Sandy Armstrong last Friday talked about creating a community. And um, again, there was, there was no script other than be honest, make the engagement, with, with people and, and, and continually build the community. You know, on Tuesday, Jesse Folia had, had mentioned uh, in his talk that if you looked at, if you canvassed all your guys and asked them, you know, on your worst practice, your worst day ever in practice is still better than what you're feeling right now, isn't it? I wonder if there's a way to, to flip the script on, you know, how horrible this is for everybody to funnel that in a positive way towards, you know, to motivate for the next season. 
because now we all appreciate what we're missing, right? I mean, all of us on these webinars, hanging out and talking, I, you know, we, we know what we're missing. And I wonder if there's a way that we make this more, in, more motivation for the next practices we finally get back to, you know? Without a doubt, um, that great ERG race that, uh, that's, that's uh, been put out there. Can't wait to look at those results. Um, I think the way that uh, some of these junior programs are having, having Zoom practices and, and submitting scores, um, uh, without a doubt. Again, we're going to find new ways of doing things. We're going to innovate. We're going to be creative. Um, never, uh, Paul Bugenhagen up at Hobart, never tell a rowing coach you can't do something. They will always figure out a solution. The, um, how, you know, Chris, as a coach and, and having a, a team uh, that counts on you for leadership, we're talking about leadership tonight. At the same time, it's got to be devastating for you. I mean, you, you had said earlier in the talk, this is one of your best jobs ever as a coach that you've done. And here you are. Like, how do you protect yourself? How do you find, how do you balance yourself to be able to be that, that reservoir of strength for the guys who are looking to you, but at the same time, you got to be hurting yourself. Like, there's got to be some mechanism to, uh, you know, to find that, you know, to protect yourself from the disappointment as well, right? Great, great question. Um, I think in that same conversation with those seniors, um, they won't be able to replicate it. I'm sure some of them will do triathlons, run 10Ks, but, uh, you know, that boat bay is special. It's a special place. Um, um, and what I said to them is, I'm going to have more seasons ahead of me. I'm going to be able to work with these great, great young men um, and women who come through this bay and, and give it their all every day. Um, for me personally, um, um, without a doubt, there is, there is pain, there is anguish. But uh, what I have learned and been guided by my mother is uh, when you're feeling like that, you do something for somebody else. You're of service. I'm a Catholic. Um, servant leadership is something that falls out of my mouth. So um, again, having to mobilize um, uh, my partner across the desk here, Jen Meredith, is running a master's program up at Cornell in its second year, but also um, is a is a very involved in the community uh, with our public health institutions. She gets sometimes gets the first calls about cancelizations and things like that. But again, just being of service. How do I mobilize? Um, I will figure out the pain. I am train working out and training and and um, trying to find meaning in all in it all, and also leading, moving people all the way through that. It's very gratifying when people kind of dig into it and you and you got some right answers and um so that's that's what i would say great question though you know i, I definitely some tears years. in there definitely some tears one of the one of uh one of the things i just want to ask you and, and i mean i i don't know if there is an answer but do you do you make your I, i've known you for years you've always been there for everybody else you know it's, it's almost like there's no chinks in the armor do you do you find yourself having to like instead of compartmentalizing your own feelings right now and putting them in a box so that you can make sure that everybody else is okay do you do you have to force yourself to to, to have those moments for yourself like just go somewhere and just let it out do you, or do you do you just keep being strong for everybody else like when when do you allow yourself to feel that to feel right. that you, you nailed it man you nailed it you nailed it um so another piece of this and something that uh I have a cousin who, who's of, of the Jewish faith, and uh, there's this great, great thing in, in the traditions of, of uh, the Jewish traditions. When somebody dies, the rabbi at the internment tells the family to go sit shiva. And that means go home, stay home, grieve. There is a tactic, go home and, and grieve, take care of what you need to take care of, and then whatever day it is, I forget, it's the Sunday, you come out and you are 
and you, you come out and you're finished grieving or you are uh, taking care of a large part of that grieving. Um, I love that. I love when there is a tactic. I love when people say, like my mother says, okay, got to go sit in the corner and cry, suck your thumb. But when you're done, it's time to, it's time to roll. Um, so um, I, I think it's, um, it's, it's ongoing. Um, I think for everybody, it's ongoing, you know, waking up in the middle of the night. Oh, geez, another, but you, you just, you just deal, you move, move on, you talk about it, you give it time, uh, you move away from it. Uh, it will always be there in whatever form and, and you cry a little bit. The, the process, there's a question from Melissa. The process of change is a process. We will not return to what we once knew as normal, and we will instead, when we are on the other side, establish a new normal. What are your thoughts on where we will land with coaching, rowing, and how we will work with athletes? Where we will land. Um, I think uh, rowing will always land where it is at the boathouse. People will always, always want to row, always want to race. People always want to row that erg, <laughs> run hills, run stadiums. Um, uh, where we will land, that is, a, um, that is the question. That is the question on everybody's Zoom uh, as we're pulling apart uh, this in athletic departments across the nation. Um, the, uh, the, the human spirit will, will, and, and rowers will, because we love to suffer, we will endure. Um, there will be racing seasons ahead. It may not look like it was in the past. It may have different players. Um, but, um, like I said earlier, you can't tell rowers not or coaches that they can't do something. So that's, people will always be attracted to it. To let's line it up. <laughs> Gentlemen, start your engines. Now, Chris, when, we, when, we're, uh, when we're looking forward and trying to anticipate where we're gonna land, you know, are you gonna find, is there a difference between finding, do we have to balance trying to keep the kids competitive and continuing to work on fitness and growth, but at the same time trying to find space to heal and, and make that team cohesion that you've been talking about, um, that you, you, know, you unleash the coxswains on and, and the captains on. Is, is, there, is it one or the other, or do you think there, there's a, a balance to be found with trying to keep them fit and motivated right now? So what do the Stoics say? They say the obstacle is the journey. The obstacle is the journey. And um, as you go through this, there will be, um, there will be losses. Uh, loved hearing Gennaro talking um, about his, his journey um, and, and what those moments um, prepare you for that next, that next time, that next event, um, those obstacles and how you navigate it and how you um, navigate your family, your team, your, your band through that defines you. And the thing that you get to do and everybody does is at every moment you get to ask yourself, who do I want to be right now? Who do I want to be for my team, my staff, my department? Um, that's the questions I ask. And it's a time to rise. It's a time to innovate. It's a time to make, make a community, make it better. Um, so I don't think it's one or the other to answer the question. I think you just use these moments to lean on, <clears throat> to carry on. Now, uh, Cynthia, Good question. Uh, Cynthia, who's a, a Cornell alum back in the 70s, uh, is reflecting about her time uh, then, and she, 
she's reflecting on the tough times that she had in, you know, in, when she went to college, uh, i.e. The, the Vietnam protests and stuff. And looking back, she thinks that brings them together more as alumni now because of they went through those times together. And this is probably one of those moments, isn't it, where, where the classes will move on and look back and this will be their, you know, not to, not to make a parallel, but this will be their, won't be their Vietnam protest, but this will be their time. Uh, of, that was a lot of struggle. Without a doubt, yeah. you look at the uh, the 1980 su summer summer squad um, with the uh, the cancel the boycott of the Moscow Olympics. Um, those guys are mobilized. Thank God we have Sean Colgan. Um, the women and and thank you for for uh, Cindy for reaching out. Um, the 70s rowers, uh, women rowers, were pioneers, as I say. Um, having to um, uh, train in the basement, having to sew their own uniforms, um, not having hot water, or a, having a lock, have a lock, having a locker room in 1980, and having hot water in that locker room in '84. They take such pride in this, and I'm so glad when I hear those stories because we have beautifully poured chocolate milk at the boathouse. It's the best chocolate milk ever. Um, and, and we have this privilege of drinking chocolate milk where these women who were pioneering, as I say, and they all said, no, 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 we just wanted to row and race. <laughs> we weren't pioneers. Well, they certainly are. And um, that's the badge. And uh, we'll all be wearing this badge. This generation, which is defining itself right now, will we'll wear this badge forward. And we continue to get to define it, don't we? Like we have yeah. the time now to, it's kind of a reset for all of our seasons. This is a reset for who we are as coaches and athletes. And, you know, we get to define where we take it, right? The landing place that we're talking about. Uh, Emmett has a question for you. How can someone find motivation to erg and work out at a time where it feels like there's no goal to be working towards without the races, for example? Um. Again, uh, a week ago, Friday, uh, Greg was talking about training zones. And there was this, uh, this, this piece of um, this knowledge about the load that athletes and coaches and administrators uh, have on their lives um, right now. Um, the athletes, the students uh, who are going home, there's, there's a tremendous load on them. Um, and I know people are training at a very, very high level, and that's, that's super honorable, super impressive. Um, I think finding time to just exercise and, and really defining that you're an athlete, um, that mission of training and that, that uh, motivation will come um, as you kind of balance the load. People are going to be starting to take classes online and um, teaching teaching sixth grade and first grade here, supporting uh, uh, my wife who's working 10 to 14 hours a day for Cornell and, and these local institutions. Um, I would say uh, understand it's hard, understand it's an opportunity to grow. Um, uh, like Gennaro talked about last night, I think even in college, he says, oh, yeah, I'd go home and I just thought I'd lose focus. And But again, I think at some point he he addressed that gap and he trained and then he went faster. So I think, again, this is just a this is um, this is just a different path. And. Um, it kind of begs the question, you know, the, like the. Eastern philosophy, the, the journey or the destination, right? Or do we row just because of the races? You know, is that our motivation? Or, you know, Peter, Peter wrote in, he said, I think much of the feeling of loss is the loss of community. Everybody can em emphasize, uh, empathize with that, but community is greater than physical presence. So, you know, rowing is, is unique like that, isn't it? I mean, it is a community, it's a niche sport, but it's a really tight community and the bonds are pretty strong even if you never rode with somebody, once you find out they're a rower, you're like, yeah, you know, like you. We know what you've been through. Yeah, it's the, it's the journey, right? I mean, you know, a, 
are we defined by the racing so, to some extent? Yeah, but in the bigger picture, I feel like rowers are rowers for life. And yeah, <laughs> they're, and definitely, they're always in the club, right? So tra tra training in an erg room and all suffering together is so much easier than <clears throat> in your maybe that question from Emmett is, is uh, goes to part of that too. You know, like there's the meaning. You know, as we continue to train, even though there's no races, maybe there's some meaning and there's some why in that. Or just redefining why she's doing it and what her objectives are. Uh, interesting question for here for you, Chris. Um, uh, outside of rowing, where do you get your inspirations? Uh, I'm inspired by my wife's work, um, her tireless uh, hours of raising our kids, um, her incredible intellect, our our marriage for sure. Um, I find inspiration in, in leaders. I love reading about um, like that guy from South Jersey, Wildwood, New Jersey, who's now the Lakers coach. <laughs> 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 and reading about how he turned around the Lakers and worked with LeBron in the front office. Um, I, love, I, I love reading about it. Um, um, yeah, and I, I, I really enjoy uh, working with my men, the athletes, uh, the women, the coxswains, who end up being almost like assistant coaches. Um, I, I really enjoy watching coaches grow through the um, occupation of coaching. It's, it's, pr it's pretty cool to see where Brumstead and I have come together in the last so I'm super inspired by that. Um, here's, a, here's a question, I think, just leadership in general. Uh, when do you know is the right time to, to have a conversation with someone whose temper and emotions may be running a little too high? Oh, that's a good one. I feel bad throwing these questions at you without any, any preparation. No, it's good. No, it's good. Actually, these are things we talk about all the time. Um, When's the right time? Um, the right time is right away uh, and being there for that person. And, and if you have enough respect for each other, um, then you'll know where they are, uh, like on that continuum of grieving. When someone is acting out or going through this, they're going through that anger, sadness, regret, uh, whatever it is, and, and meeting with them, having that opportunity to just it be rankless, allowing people to, um, I've seen a lot of, I'm in my fifties. Uh, I've seen, I, I, I've definitely been exposed to, to people um, in, in, in a lot of different ways mentally. Um, so um, I would say even if, even if you're, uh, even if you're wrong, uh, making observations about that, hey, I, I'm seeing that you're a little bit out of character here coming from a, a, a softer position. Um, again, this is something people have taught me through the years. Uh, engage. And if that person doesn't wanna talk, then, then it's not the right time to talk. But you still have to make that opportunity to, hey, the cell phone's on, call me when you can, that kind of thing. And it all comes with trust and respect and, and working people through that. The uh, so Nick D'Antoni just sent me a, a text. Love it. And it, and he, he passed along a quote that he heard from a friend of his named Larry Moore, who uh, ironically went to Cornell. And the the quote is this: "Experience is what you get when you don't get what you want." Thought that was an interesting. Is that a Cornell thing? Say that again. Experience is what you get when you don't get what you want. Yeah. So that's a pass along from Nick, from a friend of his named Larry Moore, another Cornell grad. This that's, is a, Cornell. that's a great one. That's pretty good. Uh, last, last question that I have here on, on the, uh, the chart for you. Uh, as a junior rower, how should I approach training between now and whenever this quarantine ends in the spring slash summer, we hope. Uh, I'm really afraid to stop working on the earth, but I'm also not sure how to set up a healthy plan. 
how much work on the earth should I be doing in the midst of all this mess? Yeah, so, so the engineers out there, the prospects, <clears throat> um, the guidance is stay the course, crush your academics, even if it's pass fail. This is what I told my, my guys. Um, set yourself up for success at home, good study space. As I'm saying, studying is number one. Got to get the grades. As far as training is concerned, find out what, what motivates you, create that community, um, and be accountable to each other. Be accountable to each other. Um, and that will get you through, that will see you through. If your mission, if your objective, if your goal is being recruited or rowing in college, well, what are the intermediate steps? What are, what are the things that you need to do this week uh, to prepare for that? Um, and, um, you know, people um, who have goals and, and things like that, there's a certain amount of urgency. And sometimes you, you, you got to be accountable to yourself. Got to be pissed off to be good. Good question, though. But uh, stay the course. Find out what motivates you. Work with your coaches on what you should be doing right now. And, and to that young, uh, young person who wrote that, uh, last Thursday, we had a, a really good talk with Coach Greg Hughes from Princeton. And he talked a lot about what he's telling his guys to what kind of working out they are doing. That, that is on the uh, US Rowing website. So you can go back and watch that about training zones and what kind of training you should be doing or could be doing right now. Um, and, uh, so I encourage whoever, whomever wrote that to go back and, and, and have a peek at that, that, uh, that webinar on Thursday about training zones and what this time is an opportunity for something different. And so go back and have a check on that, uh, to everybody out there, uh, Chris, uh, thanks uh, so much for joining us. This is not, um, this is not an easy topic and I don't think there are any right answers, right? They, you know, nobody's got all the answers. Um, so I wanted, to, I mean, it's so difficult to sit here and talk about this. Um, and know that there's not a script that you can just hand over to everybody or, or you know, a chart or something. Um, uh, in general, the webinars are, are on the website. You know, this week should be done um, within, uh, you know, uh, by the end of the weekend. So we'll have all of these weeks up, uh, these week's webinars. You'll find them on the U.S. Rowing uh, site right there under education and then under webinars. Um, tonight, I will send everybody, um, I will send everybody a copy of this. This, uh, this will be put up, I hope, by Monday. I'm, I'm, pretty, I'm pretty sure by Monday. But I'll send you all uh, a PDF of this webinar. If you're not getting the PDFs from me at night after the webinars are, if you're not getting them to me, there's probably a setting or it's going to spam because I, I take the whole list of everybody who joined us and I send it to everyone. So um, if there's something that you're missing, feel free always to contact Camera I and uh, we'll make sure you get it. And Chris, if you go down one more, there should be another slide after that. Um, Chris, the other thing is, and Cam, put the, uh, the link of that uh, Harvard Business Review article. Very, very insightful, short read, but um, great, great, uh, great handrail.